Welcome to Digital Two Foot Traffic. I am Kevin Shee. And I am Scott Jensen. We are digital marketers with massive experience in running brick and mortar stores. Join us each episode as we explore the latest digital marketing trends and uncover strategies from the best in the industry. Welcome to another episode of Digital to Foot Traffic. I'm your host, Kevin Shi, And I'm Scott Jensen. Good to have you back, Scott. Good for our meetup last time in Vegas. Yeah, how much of that do you remember? <laughs> Actually, uh, we would like to elaborate on that. That was a storage conference. I was there to speak um, about my accident two years ago. And then, uh, and then uh, the favorite activity was to visit the local, uh, what do you call that? Uh, what, what, what do you call those shops right now? That's legal. It, it was for marijuana, right? <laughs> and uh, I never had it. You, you know me. I'm a good boy, right? I never had it yeah, before yeah, right. <laughs> to that extent, actually. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then I didn't know there was a re- delay reaction. And, and, and by like we were the whole night. And then by, well, by the time I'd gone home an hour later, boom, it hit me. And then I was scheduled to meet you. And then that was the most anticipated meeting that we we're supposed to have. And I could not remember. <laughs> I, I can see your face. <laughs> changing a bit but <laughs> well that was pretty funny yeah so it was, it was well you were i think you were still you were just coming in i had been like you or you've been out all yeah. night so you were coming back and i was just leaving i had come down to hang out for a little bit yeah and you had gotten <laughs> you had some other things going on sorry about uh, and that. Then, yeah, <laughs> somehow we ended up at we had like a burger place for breakfast yeah i think is what we were doing and, and all the people were coming out it wasn't yeah. good. It was not good. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm I thought you hang out longer. I was skiing that week. No, I, I mean, I love the view for Tahoe. I went skiing prior to uh, to Vegas. Uh, I love Tahoe, but it was it was April first and second, right? So the snow has melted pretty bad, like pretty pretty much. It's all ice, and it's not good to to go down like a black on ice. It's, it's pretty scary. <laughs> I had to, at some point I had to uh, take off my skis and just slide down on my butt. <laughs> <laughs> in which in which I lost my credit card because of that because the credit card was on the bottom behind my pants. Seriously? Yeah. Oh man. So that was that was all right. I mean, I, I did a lot of skiing this this winter. I went to Tahoe, I went to pa- Paris and Switzerland, and I went to Japan. And I must say, I mean, of all three, I, as much as I love Tahoe, like before, like with the snow, Paris was the best. It was the most sunny. It was the longest run. The snow was great. And it, it was just all around good. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, it's like the view is, uh, uh, it's, the view is uh, amazing. I, and I formally invite you next year. Uh, you know, you, you should come, come down with us with the family. You know, we, we can do a ski trip with Cub Med or something like that next year. It'll be great. Oh, that'd be awesome. We need to, we need to plan on that. Yeah. Any, any, uh, uh, any good well, trips? You, we got to have you here though, because we skied this weekend and it's yeah. still fantastic. Snowbird was, uh, we had seven new inches today. And we're still skiing it, so it's May first. You should man. come here. <laughs> wow, wow, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, let, let me plan with you later on, and then we can do a trip in the U.S. I mean, uh, I hired a general manager for my company now, so for me not to uh, to to make her important, I have to not work. Otherwise, she has nothing to do. So I'll be I'll be <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> well, um, speaking of important, let's introduce our guest for today. All right, it's very honor. Uh, we're very honored, and I've been arranging this for a while now. We're very lucky to have our guest today. His name is Tommy Griffin. He's uh, now the founder of ClickMind. He used to be the head of uh, SEO in uh, Airbnb and PayPal. Very lucky to have you here, Tommy. Gentlemen, how's it going? How are we doing? <laughs> very, uh, very good to have you here. I heard you're in Thailand right now. I am. Yes, I'm in Koh Phangan, Thailand. Enjoying you- it very much. Are you working in Thailand? Like, are you traveling around the world like a digital nomad and, and working, or just a temporary holiday? Just a temporary holiday, um, running around right now. Yeah, I used to live in San Francisco, but um, uh, have been traveling a bit since. Was in Bali a few months last year, and um, just checking, just checking a new spot out. Great, Scott. Yeah, you got anything questions for uh, Tommy? Yeah, so uh, Tommy, so great to have you on here. Appreciate it. I'm excited to get into some of this, but I always like hearing the because Kevin and I have been doing this for a little while now. We've known each other for a while now, but I'm always interested to hear how Kevin met someone new. So give us the, uh, give us the, the version of how you and Kevin met. <laughs> uh, it was, it's, it's very brief. Uh, we were very, very drunk at a bar. Uh, <laughs> you were drunk. I was okay. <laughs> um, I, I was in Hong Kong last summer. Um, there was coincidentally a, um, a big kind of digital marketing conference and a mutual friend of ours in an entrepreneur group I'm in called the DC 
um, introduce us. We were in somewhere in Central, I think, in Hong Kong. And I wasn't at the conference, but we were all just kind of talking shop. Kevin, you'd mentioned a little bit about your, your storage business. Um, wow. There were a lot of other people there as well, very much into the crypto scene. A lot of very interesting characters in Hong Kong. And I had, I had literally landed earlier that afternoon, so um, it was kind of there, first time in Hong Kong, just for a few hours. And every person I met was just like dumbfoundingly interesting, like very, very eclectic scene. And uh, it was it was it was really cool. There's a lot of characters in Hong Kong to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, you should really come back, man. <laughs> well, that has been my experience as well. It's been fantastic, but absolutely my experience. There are a lot of characters there. Well, good. Glad to, to make your acquaintance and glad that you could join us today, Tommy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tommy, uh, can you give us a little bit of background of, of your uh, of your business, what you do? I, I just mentioned a bit of it, but can you give the full story and then uh, we can uh, go on from there? Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so I've been doing digital marketing for about ten years. Um, I started. I, I was a I was actually a finance major in college and graduated the, the same year the banks crashed. So that that didn't work. <laughs> um, I uh, got got into the way a lot of people do. I got into digital marketing um, back in 2008 after reading Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Workweek. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So kind of a pretty typical cookie cutter way to get introduced. So I uh, did that in 2008. I actually first wrote, um, I wrote an ebook, a really obnoxious, dorky ebook. Uh, after reading that book, I started selling it for $10. No one bought it. I uh, lowered the price to $5. No one bought it. And uh, then I increased the price to $47 and 250 people bought it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and I, I kind of learned search engine optimization through that way. Um, uh, was doing it sort of on the side, eventually tried to um, start a business with a friend of mine that failed miserably. Um, then I tried to start an agency on my own that failed miserably. Uh, I went to go work at an agency managing paid search in Singapore. Um, that eventually led to me coming back to the U.S. managing search engine optimization for emerging markets at PayPal um, in San Jose. I did that for two years and then moved on to Airbnb, managed search engine optimization for four years there. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of while that was going, I started teaching search engine optimization on the side. So it would work at a co-working space in San Francisco and uh, taught these Saturday morning classes to startups, startups that wanted to you know, increase their organic traffic um, and things like that. While that was happening, kind of the, the online course, you know, renaissance sort of happened. So Udemy got really, really popular while I was doing that and was sort of right place, right time there. So I took this kind of Saturday morning class I was teaching on the side um, of, my, of my primary job and created an online course for it pretty relatively early relative to now, maybe 2012. And, and it sort of took off on Udemy and it grew and grew and grew. We started using the, the SEO training course, the online SEO training course to onboard new employees to my team in Airbnb. So any designer or data scientist or engineer that joined the SEO team in Airbnb, they kind of took my course. Um, it really started to, to work. You kind of level set people that join the team. Maybe they don't know a lot about SEO. You want to get them all caught up to speed. Um, last year, I left Airbnb to go full time on ClickMinded. So ClickMinded is now a much more comprehensive digital marketing training platform. So we have seven courses, 25 hours of content, and it's with world-class instructors, right? So, you know, the social media course is taught by the head of social at Airbnb. Wow. Um, the, the content marketing course is taught by the content strategist from Lyft. Wow. Um, the sales funnels course is taught by a growth mentor from Techstars Incubator Accelerator. So now we, we work with bigger companies, um, you know, big ad agencies. That ad agencies have a huge problem now, right? A lot of the traditional print and media clearing houses, they, they, they're not going digital fast enough. They have a huge number of employees that, you know, aren't doing enough digital. And so, um, so that's kind of the problem we're trying to address is get everyone caught up to speed on, on digital marketing training. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, no, I have loads of questions for you. I didn't realize the, uh, the online the education. So I was doing online uh, education or e-learning back in say 1995, 96 range. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, with, way back, and I did that for a while, and then left to do some other things, and then went back to a company called Instructure, uh, where before we went public, uh, and went through that kind of that process. But they were doing uh, kind of facilitating online education through uh, various tools they have, like Canvas and and some things like that that help uh, the training programs that way. But uh, really fascinating that way. I didn't realize that your background went back that far. And that you had such an emphasis on that and that you're still doing piece of that. I have a load of questions for you now on that. <laughs> uh, let's 
Jeez. Um, I was going to ask you a little bit more about kind of some, well, let's start with these other questions and we'll come back to the learning stuff. I'm really interested in, you've done SEO at both Airbnb and PayPal, which are two really different businesses. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the contrast, the kind of the approach to SEO, how it differs between those two, specifically when you talk about metrics. And I think that's a big topic of conversation that Kevin and I have had because measuring things and then being able to kind of optimize against them has been a, a ongoing conversation for us. So do you want to kind of contr- or con- contrast those two things and think about kind of how do you look at metrics differently between two businesses and why? Yeah, sure. It's a really good question. Um, so there's a there's a bunch going on here. One is at the face value, the the nature of the business and how much you can move the needle on stuff. And then the other is kind of the culture of the companies, right? So just to be frank, and you know, PayPal PayPal's where I got my start, and I always have a soft spot in my heart for PayPal, even though a lot of a lot of the stuff they do absolutely infuriates me. But um, but yeah, PayPal is old. I mean, PayPal's old. Um, massive number of employees, very difficult to get stuff done. I mean, it's big company stuff, right? And so um, just on an engineering level, right, we would push out new code every two weeks, very, very slow development cycles. And at Airbnb, we'd push out code to production, we push out code to production roughly 25 times a day, right? So um, just a massive difference in what you can get done, right? Um, the online marketing team at PayPal had much less influence over kind of what was going on, whereas I was one of the uh, earlier members of the growth team at Airbnb, and just it was lightning fast how to make changes. So just on a pure operations level, it's just much much easier to get stuff done on on the Airbnb side. And so because it's more easier, because you're more nimble, you're expected to do more. The metrics are more important. You can get more into the into the details, right? Um, on a surface level, kind of what the businesses are looking for, they're very starkly different, right? So. PayPal, there's actually a much more finite universe of keywords, right? It's it's all you're always talking about non-brand, right? So non-brand phrases, different variations of you know, send money online, um, you know, online payments, um, mass transfer payments, remittance stuff, but also in 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 other languages. So both both companies are specializing in, in international SEO, right? So you know, you want to rank number one for send money online in English in the U.S. and also, you know, NVR dinero in Spanish in Mexico. And um, how do you manage that with country code top level domains and different search queries and optimizing all those pages, right? So, but the total universe of keywords was much much smaller um, with PayPal, right? Just all the, all the different variations of of ways people would send money online and all PayPal's products, kind of financial products, and there's really only a handful, so maybe ten different types of things and probably fifty different ways to query those. With Airbnb, the problem was almost infinity, right? Like, <laughs> it's every variation of accommodation you could book in every language possible, right? So, and, and, and as we grew towards the end of my time there, it became non-accommodation things as well, like experiences, right? So, you know, uh, Miami Beach vacation rental is an easy one, but, you know, there's, there's Miami Beach guest house and Miami Beach apartment and Miami Beach vacation home. And then there's... Um, Miami Beach vacation home in Spanish, right? And then there's someone in Hungary searching in Czech for Miami Beach vacation home, right? And so like there's a, there's just because when you add different country and language sort of multipliers on top of different accommodation types, on top of different city types, it's a just much more comprehensive problem, right? It's a, it's a much more engineering problem rather than like with with PayPal, we probably had 15 pages that that made up the majority of our of our non-brand traffic. Whereas with Airbnb, the the the, the theoretical maximum number of pages we were trying to get index and ranking and acquiring traffic was was north of 50 million. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huge, uh, huge, hugely different problems for sure. No, it's fascinating problems. So, uh, just a quick follow up to that, and then Kevin, I'll turn it back over to you. But can you talk a little bit of that then about how you measured success in those two arenas yeah so um, at paypal it was super messy um the other annoying part about big company stuff is you spend half your time defining metrics and <laughs> making goddamn powerpoint slides on metrics and <laughs> doing, like, doing it doing a lot of annoying stuff around that and then you know um managing up and teaching the executives what you should be doing so at at paypal it was very unrefined to be frank um it was a lot of ranking reports and, and showing traffic, but 
um, at, at, at both companies, navigational traffic was so high, right? So much navigational traffic just for the term PayPal, just for the term Airbnb. That it's, it becomes a way different problem. You have to show what piece of the business you're actually contributing to and not taking credit for the branded stuff. So at PayPal, it was just kind of constantly in flux. At Airbnb, we um, there's a really great post by the Pinterest engineering team, the Pinterest uh, SEO engineering team, on how they define their experiment framework. And we basically ran everything through experiments. So you do these massive um, tests to a subset of pages, you run an A-B test, and the incremental lift in traffic to that test you kind of um, take credit for. So every week the Airbnb growth team has these experiment reviews and everyone talks about what their hypothesis was, what they expect to do, why it's good for users. Then you show um, you show any lift you, you get in traffic to that experiment. So um, much more refined process at Airbnb, um, but it was all kind of experiment driven. That, that's great. Uh, fantastic. Go ahead, Kevin. Yes, uh, and I think uh, I think there's a lot of relevancies, or um, I think Scott have a very good understanding of what you just said because uh, Scott comes from very very similar backgrounds. I, I would assume and like work, work, uh, managing people on top and and working with like. Uh, uh, location-based uh, SEOs with extra space or with uh, the hotel stuff that, that you were doing before, right? Mm. Uh, I guess yep. my, my question my question for uh, Tommy is, uh, uh, can you give us basically like uh, the basic structure of, of Airbnb? Uh, like uh, how many people, what departments there are and who ties it up together and how do you, uh, uh, like just say what you say, how, how do you attribute the SEO success? Is it like, do you guys have a fixed set of attribution model uh, uh, or does that change? Uh, what about awareness? Uh, can you just give me a general description of uh, like what's go- going on with that big? I would like. I just really want to know like what a big company like uh, Air- uh, Airbnb with uh, everything is based on uh, digital marketing. What their digital marketing like the whole department would be consist of? Yeah, sure. Um, so caveat here is I've been out for a year. Um, yeah. I'm still super tight with everyone there, and so um, there, there have been changes for sure. But yeah, I mean the. the 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 growth while I was at Airbnb was just absolutely meteoric. All, I mean, all this stuff's public now, but I mean, yeah. the, the, just the business more than doubled every year I was there, and and all, not just the growth of the business, but but in employees as well. So, <laughs> um, yeah, probably five 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 hundred or so people total across the globe when I joined, and and probably twenty five two thousand or twenty five hundred by the time I left after four years. Just wow, <laughs> in, in, insanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the. Online marketing and growth were kind of separate things um, when we first joined. SEO was just two people when I joined, and then then just me for a while, and then um, grew to um, twelve um, to twelve by the time I left, and was growing even more after that. We had a lot of kind of the same issues, a lot of difficulty in reporting. This is a big company problem that most people won't have to experience. But when you're a massive brand. And you're you have a disproportionately large amount of branded traffic that you effectively don't want to take credit for. You have to go. Uh, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to sort of define what's actually non-brand traffic and and how to how to attribute that to your efforts, right? So if you're a small startup and you don't have a ton of traffic, just it's super easy to say what SEO is, right? Like all traffic coming in through Google Analytics defined as organic search is, is SEO, right? But if 80% of your traffic is people typing in Airbnb, Airbnb login. What is Airbnb? <laughs> you have to, you have to change that a little bit. So the way we did that, like I said before, was through experiments, right? You, you, you run really good variable tests. You um, implement a treatment onto a, onto uh, you implement a change onto a treatment group, and you measure the incremental lift. Uh, the growth team focused on a lot of different channels, and when we merged with the online marketing team, um, they uh, it became kind of a much more cohesive and, and smoothly run sort of thing because online marketing and growth are, are so synonymous, especially at Airbnb online marketing is such a huge piece of what they do. But yeah, that's the that's the sort of thing. We, we merged both those teams, everything started to work pretty well, and the way we define a lot of those metrics is, like I said before, through through experiments. So so there's, a, there's how many people are in the SEO team, in pay search, social, can you generate, like elaborate on that? On, and how many people like do the website design and, and the data scientists and all that? Oh, I mean... Yeah, you're talking about massive organizations. I mean, growth, growth, and online marketing is probably close to a hundred now. Okay, um, but was was probably fifteen when I joined. Okay, uh, ten or fifteen. Yeah, design is yeah hundreds of people for sure. Um, wow. Data data scientists. I mean, 
they're huge now, right? Like yeah. thirty billion dollars something company. So there's a lot. There's a there's a lot going on for sure. <laughs> and, and who 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 uh who makes the process of what goes to the final page? Like uh, you guys have a meeting like uh, on Skype because I, I assume the speed is re- relevance, right? So who gets to decide uh, what what goes uh, live and published? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, different um different teams within the organization own different pieces of the site. Um, okay. And and there's there's plenty of problems with that, but in general, the way the way working there really opened my eyes to how an incredible engineering organizations should work. So, like I said before, I mean, the code's being pushed to production twenty twenty five times a day. Wow. Um, and so that's you know you have teams. Everyone's kind of self policing, self managing. There's a lot of um, spec tests that tell you when things break, when people change your stuff. Yep. There's inevitably problems. I can't countless number of times where other engineers accidentally broke SEO stuff for sure, but countless other times where we we broke user experience features features right. And so, um, you know, you have meetings about it, you slack about it, um, and ultimately they 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 pick they kind of picked speed over speed and fixing things fast over this slow risk averse you know kind of PayPal process of one change every every two weeks, which is so annoying. Right? <laughs> okay. um, but the way the way the way they I, I wouldn't say there's any one kind of person, but in general, teams own specific features and you usually check in with them before you before you change stuff. Wow. Again, the caveat I haven't I haven't I've been gone for about a year, so things okay. may have changed. Scott? Yeah, let's uh Tom, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. What why the kind of shift after after kind of those those last two stints back into, and I think you gave a little bit of a preview in, in your introduction, but what's the kind of internal thing that's driving you to get to online education? Yeah. So I'm, I love, um, I love online learning. I love the teaching space. Um, I taught a graduate level elective at a unit at a grad school in San Francisco for four years. Um, it's called customer acquisition through digital marketing. So just kind of teaching, um, teaching, you know, MBA students sort of how to drive traffic to a new site through a number of different ways. And, I just think the space is incredibly underserved. Um, there's a number specifically. So just the, the way people get into digital marketing is, is fascinating. Whenever you meet digital marketers, it's usually one of two ways. They, they and, and it usually involves falling ass backwards into it. Right. So like people are either kind of self-taught you know, they work on their own projects. They get into Amazon selling or they write, they, they have their own site or their own blog or whatever it is, or their boss one day drops on their lap and says like, Hey, we need more traffic. Go figure this out. Right. There's now this attempt to teach a lot of this stuff, and it's going very badly. I, I really like the kind of general assembly coding bootcamp model of these 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 guys that have come in and they're trying to do an alternative to higher level education. That's sort of what ClickMinded is moving towards, kind of a, a general assembly for digital marketing, or um, like a like a hack reactor or one of these coding bootcamps for for digital marketing. But what's incredibly frustrating and and appalling is how graduate level universities are doing this, right? There's dozens of universities in the US that are offering master's degrees in digital marketing. They are completely pointless. <laughs> they cost between 30 to 100 30 to $100,000 for these degrees. They are very, very bad curriculums and they are convincing these young impressionable kids that they need this. I've hired people at PayPal and Airbnb, and I will tell you right now that no one at a legitimate company that's hiring digital marketers would ever look for a master's degree in digital marketing, right? It's all portfolio-based or experience-based, which is a huge chicken and egg problem for applicants, but universities have jumped on this trend. They found something that people want to learn. They're charging obscene amounts for it, and it's, it's not good. It's not right. The trillion dollars worth of student debt in the United States right now, and digital marketing degrees are, are a small piece of that, but... To me, the, this online learning renaissance can solve so many problems. The market opportunity is, is massive, and we're starting with digital marketing. That's the idea. That's fantastic. Quite a few things there. I completely understand it an issue. Let's, I'm curious as to your thoughts on where does you know, online learning work well, and where does it fall short, in your opinion? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, rocket scientists, brain surgeons, and pediatricians probably shouldn't take Udemy classes, right? Like, I, <laughs> I, get, I get that. I get that yeah. for sure. But, but you know, uh, I think digital marketing is a great, great way to learn, right? Uh, great for online courses. We have um, we have over 9,000 paid users on, on ClickMind. A lot of people really learning a lot and getting a ton of value out of it. 
Um, a lot of these digital skills, right? Photoshop classes, general design stuff, um, lots of lots of engineering based stuff. You know, learning Rails or Python or anything like that. A lot of sort of web focused stuff is great for online learning, especially when you know you link out to resources and tutorials, um, things like that. Um, anything that's sort of digital seems to really work. You know, everyone has different learning styles, but um, I've seen a lot of kind of digital skills, you know, engineering based stuff, marketing based stuff copywriting, things like that, all seem to work pretty well online. That's good. Where are you seeing success from a from a, a student to employment standpoint? Do you have a couple of examples you can give for us? We do. I mean, yeah, we have, we're probably close to 100 examples now. I mean, 9,000 users of the SEO course has been, has been a product for about five years. So there's, um, there's a lot of, it's, it's really cool to hear, you know, you, you find solopreneurs and individual consultants saying they double their business, um, young kids out of school or people that want to change their job entirely, getting a promotion or changing jobs, um, had people that kind of just wanted to learn SEO as one piece of what they do and now they're the head of SEO somewhere. Uh, and we, we, we don't want to take credit for all of that. It's just more about getting people started, answering their questions um, in the early days, getting them inspired and fired up and, um, and then you know kind of checking in on them on a few special cases as they as they've gone along but but yeah there's um there's there's plenty of people out there that have taken the course and you know managing teams of seos now which, which is great they, they know way more than me that's for sure <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's how that works all right well where do you see pull out your crystal ball for a minute and where do you see like online education and specifically around digital marketing uh that probably a two-part question then where do you see digital marketing really growing in, or changing is probably a better word. Where is it changing in the next, say, two years? And how do you see online education going to either meet or, or surpass that, I think? Yeah, so um, I'm getting really excited and, you know, uh, playing along the lines of you know, digital marketing for, for foot traffic stuff. I really love, um, I think local SEO is becoming much more important and more specifically um, voice search. <laughs> I am getting really, really excited for voice search. I think voice search is going to be the next SEO. Um, voice search on your mobile when you're out and about. Um, and the kind of more sexy one, I think it's further away, but um, it, but it's similar is kind of the Google Home and Alexa optimization. So all voice search is predicated on structured data, schema markup, right? And it's just a different type of SEO. Um, but the basic idea here is you're making... Uh, more and more data machine readable so that voice commands can render those results for you. And I think what's interesting about it is there's going to be fewer winners, right? So you envision if I'm in Hong Kong and I'm on my phone or I'm in Salt Lake City, wherever it is, and I say, you know, where, where's a coffee shop's near me, right? Um, the general results Google's going to render for you, uh, similar to like the, the local pack, when you do a local result, you... you for a while, you'd see seven results. Now you often see three on mobile. Um, I think structured data for local search activated by voice is gonna be really important. And I think Google's only gonna offer you one or two or maybe three options um, when you do that. So, so being the winner on voice search related stuff for local SEO uh, is gonna be super important in the next few years. Wow, well, you hit a super nerve with Kevin. <laughs> I know he's got a question for you after that. This is, like, this is one of his favorite topics of all time. Yeah, um, search right now is, I mean, voice search right now is not that uh, popular. In fact, a lot of local SEO guys think it's a waste of time here, which I think is completely wrong uh, because uh, Alexa is not available right now in Hong Kong. I guess they're afraid that the Ch Chinese would copy it, right? I bought mine in Amazon in the U.S., but I have to filter, like I have to tinker with it uh, to make it work. And I can't really order a pizza or get an Uber here because it's not aligned with the services here. So I guess... With 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 the with the boom that takes off in uh, in the U.S. Uh, like Asia, especially like in China, is going to uh, have a huge awakening with that. But moving on from 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 that uh, from that question, I want to talk a bit more about location specific uh, targeting. Uh, what are your some of your tricks uh, uh, for for retailers if they don't want like general, just like city of New York or Hong Kong, they don't want everybody in New York or Hong Kong to go on their website, but uh, specifically people from a certain area. Like a certain area, like within that five block radius. What are some of the local uh, SEO tricks that you guys did in Airbnb that 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 you, you would advise? Yeah, I actually don't have any strong advice on this. Um, okay. Airbnb was not a local SEO play. Yeah, I uh, guess. It, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't brick and mortar. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so we don't, I don't really have anything um, helpful to, contri to contribute. Okay, to sorry. Okay, let me let me ask you uh, let, let me ask you uh, another question then. Uh, for SEO for uh, different cities, uh, what kind of like specific tricks do you guys do to bring people into the traffic? Does have a specific location, but how how do you like as a person like if I have a house I want to list in uh, Airbnb, what kind of things that would uh, that would uh, make make my location shine out? So are you asking about things we do for city specific rankings or things Airbnb hosts should do? Uh, I, I guess that's a two-part question. Uh, a city-specific yeah. ranking and then a specific host should do. Yeah, so the city-specific ranking, it actually has less to do with the city in general and more to do with just regular document relevancy, right? So, like, it, it's not... The, the wrong way to think about it is a regular Google search, right? Coffee Shop San Francisco, you get the local pack, you get a map. That's not what we were, right? Like, uh, property, property addresses are not listed on the site, right? We keep those private, and yep. so... There's no, there's no, it's not like we have a million Google My Business listings, right? We just yep. have one page and a bunch of listings on it. Yep. Um, the things we do to get, you know, ranking for Vacation Homes Atlanta and Vacation Homes Houston and Vacation Homes San Diego are what you would regularly do for, for SEO, right? You make sure your internal links are, are really strong. Yep. You make sure you have external links that are kind of mentioning whatever that topic is about. You try and get the, the primary keyword as, as crawlable text on your page, yeah. you try and generally make sure that document is, is relevant for that phrase, right? Latent semantic indexing and all the other things that, 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 that you would do. Um, okay. On the Airbnb host side, yeah, there's, they've actually published, there's a public blog post where you can read about it. Um, my, my favorite thing about this, um, and it, it's all, you know, we had a bunch of Google engineers that worked at Airbnb. I know a bunch of search quality people at Google. Um, I, I know a bunch of SEOs. And the funniest part about Google's algorithm and, and Google, you know, results and, and trying to decode the, the algorithm like everyone wants to do. The funniest part is the more you learn about it, the more you realize that it, it, it it's much more um, straightforward than you'd imagine. There's really not a, a magic secret. Like, um, it's all the things <laughs> yeah. that you would expect. And with Airbnb rankings, it's everything you would expect as well, right? Like, in our case, it's make sure you're a great host, make sure you have high quality photos, make sure you respond to users on time. Like, it's all the quality signals that you would imagine on an Amazon listing, on a Pinterest listing, um, on YouTube. Like in general, they're looking for quality signals that are helpful for users, and as long as you're doing that, um, you'll you'll generally rank higher. All right, great, Scott. You got a question? Yeah, last question for you, Tommy. This is uh, I, this has been fascinating and great. I want to come back to maybe kind of circle back with two things that you've talked about here. One is about voice, and then learning. What advice do you have for the, the local marketer uh, who's trying to who can see kind of the voice search revolution coming? And I agree with you completely. It looks like right now that there's going to be limited research, kind of limited uh, search results as we are, we've come to know them. Although, like I can book a, a hotel room now or I can book a car room using uh, voice search and, and a number of different devices. But for those people that are local marketers, they're looking at kind of digital foot traffic how would you suggest they go about making themselves experts and what are the things they need to look at to see this coming up to them? What do you think? Yeah, I think very broadly, the move is going to be a combination of local SEO and structured data. Um, schema markup, structured data, any, anything that is machine readable, understanding um, what, what is machine readable. And the easy way to think of, of that is um, if you look into Google's Hummingbird update and specifically the knowledge graph stuff. So Anytime you see a big box on the right-hand results, uh, whenever you search for something, that's kind of the machine-readable structured data stuff. Oh. And, right? And so anytime you see kind of the Wikipedia-ish looking box in Google's results, that's all machine-readable. That's all applicable for voice search, right? So a really fun way to do this is, first of all, stop search on mobile devices, stop typing, right? Just always do voice. Yeah. Um, but also, like, look at what look at these um, entity relationships and 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 start having fun make, make, make it a little bit of a game like one of my favorite things to do okay you say you say a celebrity's name or a politician or you know someone that's in the public eye that has this knowledge graph and start using your voice to figure out more data about them that Google can figure out so like one of my favorite examples of this you know you can say who is the Dallas Cowboys quarterback and then you know things like how tall is he how much does he make? 
and you start to see that that Google's getting incredibly good at understanding entity relationships. Like this, this is a person. They can have a height associated with them. They can have a salary associated with them, and it's incredibly powerful. So once you understand the the links that Google's making with these knowledge graph relationships, you sort of think, okay, actually, how is this going to work in the real world? When, when I say my voice search, I'm hungry. Where should I go? What results will render? Right? I'm I'm or, or different variations like I'm tired. What should I do? Right? Like. Um, what what is Google going to start rendering as results? And just being there is going to be enough for the first for the next two years. Like just playing around with this stuff and trying to get something ranking, you're probably going to have a massive advantage when this becomes the default way to search five ten years from now. Do you think it's going to be that long? But you <laughs> haven't seen my eleven year old recently because the kid refuses to type, but he does all voice search. But no, that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Wow, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, I heard you have a book, uh, Tommy. Can you uh, can you describe if we can uh, read your book? Uh, my friend, uh, my friend told me you have a book. Oh uh, no, I do not have a book. Really? <laughs> well, I guess I got my I got my info wrong. But uh, if you want to use your service, can you uh, give us uh, some contacts and how can they can reach you or or uh, where, where they can use your service? Yeah, sure. Clickminded.com is digital marketing um, training platform for startups. We have a ton of awesome free resources on there. Okay. And uh, digital marketing SOPs. Um, so feel free to check it out. We also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clickmind. Wow. Okay. Be sure, uh, be sure uh, listeners, to, to check out on that. Any last thoughts, uh, Scott? No, this was great. Really appreciate it, Tommy, your time and uh, really enjoyable and, and, and right on. I, thank you very much. Yeah, for sure. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate yeah, it. I'll be yeah. in Hong Kong. Uh, I'll be in Hong Kong next week, actually. So if you guys are there, um, or <laughs> if come listeners are there, if, yeah, if any of your listeners are there, hit yeah. me up and grab yeah. coffee. Yeah, come, come join us, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I might take you up on that. <laughs> but uh, th- right. thank you, uh, thank you, Tommy. Uh, it's good to have you here. I look forward to see you uh, in, in Hong Kong. Maybe we can ask uh, Chris to come down. We can have a drink. Sweet. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Digital to Foot Traffic. Join our mailing list at digitaltofoottraffic.com for more of our digital insights and strategies. Leave us a review on iTunes or your favorite Android apps and subscribe so we'll show you the second we launch a new episode.